Lord be with you. On this Father's Day in June, we wish all those fathers here present and online just a happy Father's Day. May today be filled with rich blessings and just an experience of life together. Part of the rhythm of today is that we gather in the presence of our Heavenly Father, and we are reminded of God's goodness, and we are reminded of God's presence, and we are reminded of God's promises that are established in each and every one of our lives. And as we live into those promises this morning, I just simply want to pray for us, asking that the Spirit of the Lord is present here, and that we would just open ourselves to God's movement among us as he shapes and forms and invites us into life with him. Friends, will you pray with me this morning? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, on this Father's Day, we gather in celebration of who you are as our Heavenly Father. The blessings that you've provided for us, the richness of life, the beauty of life that surrounds us, the beauty of life we get to enjoy. Lord, part of one of the the great gifts that you've given us is to worship, to sing, to pray, to gather together with your people, to be a part of the body of Christ, to be a part of your family. Today, as we worship, we pray that your Holy Spirit will gather us each as a child is drawn into their father's arms. Would you draw us into your arms? And may we experience a richness and abundance of beauty of life. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. brothers and sisters in Christ, my friends, on this Sabbath day, to each and to all, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. we live in fellowship with God, we live in fellowship with the body of Christ. Friends, will you take time this morning to greet those around you? with me this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we have entered into your presence, reminded that you are our creator, provider, sustainer of life, that you are the one who redeems us, saves us, sustains us. You've given us the gift of your spirit. You have constantly provided in a generosity for all the things that we need. And yet so often, 
even in your generosity, we respond with selfishness, with sin. Lord, we have to confess to you that the inclination of our heart is for self. Lord, we are a people who sin because our nature is sinful. And so on this Sunday morning, together, we just collectively come before you in a place of confession. Lord, our minds often tangled, our hearts often broken, our souls often filled with darkness, our flesh weak. We confess to you that apart from you, we can do nothing. But we also confess that we believe, despite being sinners, that what you have done for us in your great love through the gift of your grace in an act of unbelievable and amazing mercy have provided salvation for each and for all. You just simply ask us to trust you. And so, Lord, today would you remind us again that in Christ we are forgiven that we are people of grace and that you have paid every last requirement for us on the cross, that you brought us to life in the resurrection and that you sustain that life through the power and the presence of your spirit. Lord, may we be a people today who not only experience the gospel but live it out. We praise you for being our God and for giving us the gift of being your people and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear these words of assurance from Psalm 103. Here's the first part. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Just a little bit further down in this same psalm, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. All of this to say, on this Father's Day, we can trust our Heavenly Father and what He has done for us. Friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we are forgiven. We are people of grace. Amen? Amen.
It's hard to imagine where I'd be without you. The truth is, I've learned so much by simply watching you. I've learned what it means to care about people and put others before myself. I've learned how to live a life of integrity and have the heart of a servant. I've learned to honor God in all I do and seek his will for my life. Thank you for the discipline I deserved and the grace I did not. Thank you for guiding me, encouraging me, and picking me up when I failed. Thank you for living out your faith and showing me how to live out mine. As I look back, I can see moment after moment where your strength, your wisdom, and your love made all the difference. There's so much of you I carry with me, memories I treasure, and lessons I cherish. Today, Dad, I want to say thank you and let you know just how much I love you. Happy Father's Day. Let's pray together. Lord, it's a day of thanksgiving, a day for us to recognize your goodness, your grace, your power, your blessing in our lives through our fathers or through some of the men that you've used just to shape and form and teach us Lord, thank you for the gift of relationship and allowing us to share in those significant places of investment. Lord, thanks for places of protection where we have felt safe. Thank you for the gift of provision where we have been provided for in ways that, and with costs that we don't even recognize or see. Thanks for the way that dads have showed us what it means to work and the wisdom that they have brought and the listening ears they have heard all of the things with. Lord, thanks for fathers who simply have a presence that is a gift of security. Thanks for the way that we have learned and been shaped and formed in places of wisdom, in places of knowledge, places of just simple things like learning how to change a tire or to fix a sink. Lord, thanks for the generosity that we have experienced through our fathers and through you. And Lord, as we live into that place of thanksgiving, we pray that we will risk those places today. Sometimes fathers don't always share the affection. We pray that today as children, we will offer the words, I love you, and offer the words of how proud we are to be children Lord, that we'll live in the richness of what it means to share in that expression simply because of the way that you have expressed to us your great love. Lord, we get to see the picture of you in so many different ways through our fathers. And we pray that you will bless them today with the richness and an abundance of your grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple of announcements this morning. First, uh, just coming back from the General Synod in Pella, Iowa last week. There's lots to report and share. Sarah Dunkerslut and I are actually going to do that in an upcoming service. We're just trying to figure out the exact day. But one of the key highlights for us specifically as a church is for as many years as they've provided this award, we have received a Mission Impact Award as a church. We're one of 33 churches in the denomination who has received this award, and it's because of our commitment to mission, and specifically global mission. And it seems appropriate for us to announce that this morning, especially as this is a week of us sending folks. This morning at 6 o'clock, our high school students and leaders gathered in the north parking lot, and they headed out for West Virginia on a mission trip. Steve and Brenda Isinger are headed off to Alaska to serve at summer camp, and they're our mission of the month, and so I'm going to invite Steve or Brenda or both or however this is going to work to come up and share a little bit about the work that they'll be doing this summer. Brother, welcome. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> My name is Steve Isinga. For those that don't know, 
For the last four years, Brendan and I have gone up to Camp Liwa. Liwa is one of two camps of Victory Ministries in Alaska. The Victory... A little higher. I'm tall. One of the camps that Victory Ministries has is by the Matanuska Glacier. It, uh, our church went there about 20 years ago. Uh, we work at the camp north of Fairbanks. It's a great location. Um, in some sense, it's kind of the closest thing to Disneyland for a thousand miles. So we get a great diversity of kids that come. We can get kids from a little farther north into remote villages. We get a lot of military kids. We have Fort Wainwright is right near Fairbanks and or in Fairbanks. Uh, Ielson Air Force Base is near Fairbanks. So we get a lot of influx of, of those kids. Church for military kids can be a difficult difficult thing since everybody's moving and uh, deployments and such. We get kids that are Catholics. We get kids that are agnostics. We get kids that have no clue what's going on with the, with the Bible. They're just coming to have fun at camp. And that's kind of our goal. We have fun at camp but we also learned the gospel. This year we're looking forward to 600 kids up from 450 last year. So we've got a lot of changes coming. We've got two new cabins uh, that were built and um, they're full. Uh, we will be heading up this week. And the, the needs are great. One of the things to tie in a Father's Day plug here this past week, I was just talking with them last night up in camp. This past week, a little boy came. He was a little, it was a challenging week. We had some challenging kids. And at the end of the week, one of the kids said, I like the dads here. I came without a dad. I don't have a dad. The dads here are nice. And you wonder, what is this kid coming from? What, what kind of homeland does, like, does he have? Will he ever hear the gospel? Where am I here? <laughs> um, we, all, we all have fun. But the... the the rule of the counselors is they, they have to know where every kid stands to Christ by the end of the week. And most of them know that pretty early on. Had 12 kids come to know Christ or made decisions for Christ last week. Um, these are the littler kids. They keep getting older throughout the summer. We're going to be heading there this week. Um, a couple of things that I would like our church to do is in the coming years, it would be cool to have some counselors from faith go up to Fairbanks. It would be cool to have some campers go up to faith or up to up to Liwa. Uh, in two years, probably, there's going to be a building project that I would love our church to get involved with. Not saying that Liwa is anything special. I'm sure you hear these stories from Geneva or Cran Hill or Grace or or Christian Caribbean Christian Center. They're just the, this is the one that we get involved with, and it really not sure exactly why. It just seems that Lyra chose us. So um, thank you for your support. Thanks for being the mission of the month. Thanks, buddy. want to pray for Steve and Brenda this morning. We want to pray for our students who are off on their way to West Virginia, for Marsha, for a lot of mission things. And so um, we pray because God's listening and we believe that God just can demonstrate a power that is not our own. And so let's pray together. Lord, thanks for inviting us to participate with you in the mission to restore and reconcile and to make new your creation. Lord, first you start with us, you transform our heart, mind, soul, and then in that transformation, you invite us to join you. Lord, we're humbled to be able to participate in such beautiful and really quite simple ways. Lord, for Steve and Brenda and for their passion, for the love that they have for the place in Alaska and Lord, just for the students who will be there this coming week and in the weeks to come, Lord, we pray your blessing on Camp Liwa and just ask that there would continue to be students who come to know you as Lord and Savior because of that ministry. Ultimately, that's what it's about. 
We pray that we'll live into what it means to be supportive, both prayerfully and resource. But we also pray that we will be an encouragement to Steve and Brenda and that they will just know an overwhelming sense of your spirit's presence. Lord, we pray that same prayer for Pastor Marcia, for Jonathan, for the team from Words of Hope that are headed off to Turkey tomorrow. We just pray your blessing over them for safety, for travel. But ultimately, Lord, that you would equip those Iranian Christians who are coming in secret to hear and to learn about reconciliation, forgiveness, and the power of the gospel. Lord, we pray that your spirit will equip and enable them to go then back to Iran and to bring that mission to people who don't know the power and the wonder of the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for our students who are headed off to West Virginia this week. We pray there as well with parents, safe travel, a blessing. We pray rich relationships and rich conversation. But more than anything else, we pray for a richness of life with you. Lord, that their heart, mind, soul would just be stirred by your spirit as they live in relationship with each other, as they live in places of mission and support, as they serve with their gifts. Lord, would you just cause this week to be one that's extraordinary and beautiful. Lord, thanks for places like Camp Geneva, for Cran Hill, for Spring Hill, for Young Life Camps, and for the number of students who will be impacted because of the ministries that are in those places. Again, we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we recognize the importance of that as we look around the world. Lord, whether it's the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, whether it's the constant tensions that seem to be rising up, whether it's the reality of what we will recognize tomorrow, that slavery and oppression are very real in the world in which we live, and that we as a country that are free will live into the celebration of that. But Lord, also give us a mind for those people who live in the enslavement of the sin and the brokenness of the world around us. Lord, thanks for your grace in the midst of a world that seems so dark and weighted. And because of your grace, because of your deep care and love for each and every one of us, Lord, we pray. We pray in intercession for Herc and Lynn Valling, just asking that in the current place they find themselves on a journey of dealing with the disease, that each day they would know a daily reminder of your grace and the hope of the gospel. We pray for Sam Mulder, who continues to live into what it means to be a young man whose life at times seems to be defined by cancer. Lord, we pray that your love, the gospel, and your purpose and plan for Sam will be what defines him. For Doug and Linnell Danker, for Tim and Kim Clunder, Lord, they face long journeys, and yet we give you thanks at this stage in the road that things seem to be going very well. We attribute that to your grace and goodness, and we continue to pray for just the power of healing, of life, for you to give wisdom and understanding to doctors and to treatment options, and Lord, that we will just be a people who continue to pray for them daily. For Robert and Nancy Morgan, for Beth and Doug Van Dyken, for Amy Ritzma. Lord, we just continue to pray. People, bring up people before you who are dealing with cancer and have been on long journeys. Lord, we pray for Ruth Ann and Jean Voss. We pray that as Ruth Ann has had treatment this past week, that her body will live in a place of restoration. We pray that you will continue to provide life and healing. Lord, would you infuse her spirit with just a comfort and a whisper that would know that you're near. For Lee Weaver, who spent time in the hospital, for Chuck Berghorst, Lord, for Marie and Eugene Spoolman, for Marie, who's been in the hospital, whose memory seems to be fading, who's dealing with a lot of different things, we just continue to ask for the gift of life to blanket all of these, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, for Mary and for Rick Vandermeulen, as they mourn the loss of a 44-year-old niece, for Laura's family, for Chris, her husband, for children, we just pray that you will blanket them in your provision and your power. Lord, we're a people who live in relationship with you because of you. You've given us revelation. You've placed promises before us. 
You've given us the gift of sacraments and of being a part of the body of Christ. You've allowed us to experience and understand the wonder of what it means to be people of the word. And Lord, we pray that as we live into that as a community across all generations, that there will be a richness of life with you and with each other that's a part of Faith Reformed Church. Help us to be a community that cares deeply about each other and around, about the world around us. But help us to live into it with a wisdom, a thoughtfulness, a kindness, really to bear the fruit of the Spirit that you have called us to live into. Lord, we bless you for your goodness. We pray into the fullness of who you've called and created us to be. Will you continue to shape, form, lead, and bless this congregation? And Lord, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. We're in a series on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, today our reading is from Peter's first letter, and it is specific to the fruit of joy. Um, from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Just an aside, this is my favorite scripture passage in all of the Bible, so be prepared to be here for a while. Just kidding. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for his salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. An indescribable and glorious joy. An indescribable and glorious joy. What does that possibly look like? I think babies sometimes give us the best expression of some of our best emotions. And so maybe this will provide a little bit of indescribable and glorious joy. <laughs> and then we have another one.
We all need a little bit of that, don't we? Friends, we live in a world that lacks joy. We live in a world that seems focused in on a lot of things, but not very focused in on joy. Even though the very heart of most of who we are, we long for that expression of life, for that vibrancy, for that vitality to be flowing through our veins. And my hope this morning is to equip us in such a way that we can live in the world in which we live with, as Peter describes, an indescribable and glorious joy. Part of the reason why we do not experience much joy in our life, I believe, is because we spend so much of our focus on what we do not have instead of focusing on what we do already have. We spend so much time focused in on the time we don't have to do the things that we really want to do or the things that might cause us joy. We spend a lot of focus in on not having the necessary resources to provide the kind of joy we want to experience. We spend a lot of time focused in on not having the right kind of influence. The not enough mentality begins to seep in. And as we begin to realize that we don't have enough or we begin to think we don't have enough, that begins to infect us in significant ways. When you top that with a reality of our culture that's experiencing high levels of inflation, when you top that with a workforce that seems significantly depleted, when you top that with a supply chain that doesn't seem to be catching up, for the most part, the American people, the North American people are living in a place where we are in a dissatisfied, and in our dissatisfaction, we are living in this constant rhythm where we're evaluating our relationships, we're evaluating our responsibilities, we're evaluating our roles, and for the most part, our evaluation lands in places of the things we do not have. But what if, what if this morning there could be a change in our mind? What if there could be a shift in our way of thinking and in that shift that we would begin to experience joy that we can not just experience in worship, but a joy that we can carry with us into the world in which we live. This is the reality of what Peter is writing about this morning. As Peter is writing, this is the first chapter, Peter is writing to a people whose lives are not very easy, in fact, they have been displaced, they have been persecuted, and they have been moved into places that they have not planned for or intended to live. Peter's letter starts this way. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he writes this, to the exiles of the dispersion, to the people who have been taken from their land and the things they know and the traditions they experience and the language they understand and have been, because of persecution for being followers of Jesus, dispersed from Jerusalem. They've been dispersed around Asia Minor to places in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia a people who have been exiled in dispersion. And then Peter writes, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. Yes, your life has become difficult. Yes, you face challenges each and every day in the new places that you live. Yes, you're having to learn all kinds of new things. But Peter starts his letter with this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the dispersion, in the being exiled, Peter reminds the people to bless God. And why? Because of what they already have. Not because of what they don't have. 
Friends, this is the equation of true joy. If we want to experience joy in our life, it's not because of something that we don't have that we're going to get. It's because of what we already have in Christ. So, what do we already have in Christ? Well, Peter tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope. We have been born again. There's a reason why we have to be born again. When we are born into the earthly life, separated from God, we are born into a relationship that is fractured, that is separated. The children that are born at Holland Hospital, at Zealand Hospital, at every hospital, every child that's born around the world is a child that is born into separated relationship with God. And in that separation, there's a need for them to be born again, not of a physical birth, but of a spiritual birth. And the spiritual birth is one that takes that which separates us, our sinful nature. Christ has done what's necessary for us in that relationship to reconcile us, to birth us again in Christ into restored and reconciled relationship with God. And so Peter is telling the people, yes, the circumstances of your life are challenging. Yes, you are exiled. Yes, you have been dispersed. But don't forget what you already have and who you are. This is the source of your joy. Because of God's mercy, you've been born again. The Spirit has birthed something new inside of you. Just as the Spirit hovered over the womb of Mary, just as the Spirit hovered over all creation, the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, hovers over us and creates life in us, and that creation is a new birth that comes into a living hope. We have a hope that's alive, alive with an understanding that what we experience is not just the definition of who we are. Our bank account doesn't define who we are. Our responsibilities and roles do not define who we are. The very thing that defines who we are is the new birth we have in Christ into a living hope. And so, Peter, writing to the people of the first century church, is also writing to us, and what's he saying? Blessed be God. Because of God's mercy to each and every one of us, we have a new birth into a living hope through what? The resurrection, the aliveness of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are people who are alive despite being and living in a world of death. But it's not just that that we have. It also is an inheritance And what kind of inheritance? An inheritance that is imperishable. An imperishable inheritance that cannot go bad. When I was in college, I had roommates who were disgusting and wrong. They wouldn't throw out food or garbage. It would just fester in this room. We came back from spring break one year and there was in this side room, a bag of potatoes that had been there since September. And now spring had set in. It stunk to high heaven. It was terrible. We got soccer socks because we were all in the soccer team. We soaked them in cologne. We wrapped the cologne part under our nostrils. We tied it and we carried that bag of rotten, nasty, liquefied potatoes out We dug a hole and we buried the bag, everything, in the back. Why did those potatoes stink so bad? Because they had perished. They were beyond their expiration date. The inheritance we're talking about of the new birth we have in Christ, the living hope is an inheritance that cannot go bad no matter what happens in our life, whether we're exiled or dispersed or we get a diagnosis 
or someone who's close to us dies, or we lose a job, or there's financial challenges, the inheritance we have in Christ, we have been marked as members of God's family, cannot go bad. It is unfading. It can't get dim. It doesn't turn itself down. And imperishable, unfading, and undefiled. There is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. It is perfect in its gift of being an inheritance from God to us. And so what do we have, not what we don't have, what do we have in Christ? Blessed be God and Father by his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, being kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God. And then Peter writes this line, in this you rejoice. In this. In what? In the new birth. In the living hope. In the inheritance. In the protection of God. In these things you rejoice, even if now, well, you've had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith though perishable, be, can be tested by fire. Friends, do you understand what Peter's telling the early church and telling us? He's telling us that in Christ, no matter what happens around us, what's already happened for us is our source of joy. This is where we find that expression of life. But Peter doesn't stop there. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And although you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice in an indescribable and glorious joy. Recognize the equation there. We don't experience joy and then believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus... And that belief in Jesus creates in us the indescribable and glorious joy. We believe in Jesus, and that belief, that faith, creates in us, through the power of God's Spirit, the indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith. I want to just step back for a moment and recognize all that we get to receive in this. We live in a world that says earn it, work for it. Hard work pays off. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It's how much time you invest, all of those things. And they're not bad things. The challenge is when we bring that work mentality to our understanding of faith that we somehow by works are going to save ourselves. This is one of the reasons why I believe the North American church is so lack or void of joy because we have understood our theology to be one of works way too often. Listen to the passage again. Peter telling the people what God has just simply given to them as a gift. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, being kept in heaven for you. He has given us. It's a gift. It's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says it's a gift that no one may boast. You are saved by grace. Our joy is experienced when we understand that we receive this gift, that we accept what God has done, and in believing and trusting what God has done, that's our source of joy. We're reconciled to God because of Christ. We're restored in relationship because of Christ, not 
because of anything we've done. Later, and you will, you will believe in him and you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy for you are receiving the outcome of your faith. Again, it's a gift that we have to receive. At the very end of Heidelberg Catechism, question and, number, question and answer number 60, the question is, how are you right with God? In the midst of the answer, it's out of sheer grace, without my deserving it at all. And the very end of that Heidelberg Catechism says, all I have to do is accept this gift with a believing heart. We receive, our source of joy is that we received a gift from God. It's a new birth into a living hope, into an inheritance. We're being protected by God. All of this is our source of joy. So how do we do that? How do we live into that joy? Again, I want to equip us to leave here today carrying that into the world in which we live on a daily basis. So I'll come to the baptismal font. Would you with me this morning just maybe do something? Would, would you just put your hand on your forehead? My guess is for most of us, who have grown up in the Reformed Church or within the Protestant expression, for most of us there was baptism either as an infant or as an adult. And in that baptism, something happened. Now I will tell you, it's ordinary water that goes in there on any Sunday morning that we do baptism. Next Sunday morning, we have three baptisms. It will just be ordinary water from the tap, either here in the workroom or from the kitchen downstairs. And I'll give you a secret. We typically put warm water in there. We don't want the child to suddenly be stunned by cold water and scream. So we put warm water in there, but there's something that God does in the midst of that where through the power of God's Spirit in any baptism, the baptisms that we'll celebrate next week, for the baptisms of the Barkle children, for the baptisms of of all of us looking out here for the baptism of the oldest person gathered in this room, and now there's a bunch of people going, am I the oldest in this room or is there someone else older? That in that moment, wherever it was and whenever it was, God established promises in your life and in our life together. And those promises were signed and sealed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The pastor may, on that Sunday morning when it happened, he or she may have taken water and put it on your forehead in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And there was a Holy Spirit infusion that happened where ordinary water placed a sign and seal on your life and on my life. And those promises were signified by three things that I want us just to carry with us when we leave today. Here's the first thing. There was a covenant that was established. Baptism, an infant baptism, is actually an expression, Old Testament, that links it to circumcision. When you're a person, a part of the family of God, there is a circumcision of spiritual circumcision that happens that's signified by baptism in the midst of that. And so we are baptized into a covenant of promises. And that promise is this, that you belong to the family of God. Even though you're a little baby who doesn't know anything, God has already established promises in your life. Promises. We can better understand it this way just simply a phrase, I belong. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the covenant of salvation means I belong. I belong to God's family. I belong to the citizenship of heaven. I belong from, from one generation to the next. I belong. Here's the second thing. There is a entering into the water 
just like we physically do in the dirt of our sin, there is a washing away and there is a coming out of the water and being clean. But there's another picture in the midst of this, and it's the picture of the resurrection. There is an entering into the death or into the tomb of Christ. There's being dead in the tomb, and there's being raised out in life. So we say this, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the covenant of salvation, I belong, mercy, forgiveness, and grace through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, or an easier way, I am forgiven. I belong, I am forgiven, and then the wonder of wonders, we are actually a Holy Spirit people who emphasize the Spirit in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a promise that's signed and sealed of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. So in the name of Holy Spirit, there is a promise of Holy Spirit, or another way for us to think about this is the Spirit is with me. So here's the three phrases. I belong, I'm forgiven, the Spirit is with me. I belong, I'm forgiven, the Spirit is with me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I belong, I am forgiven, the Spirit is with me. Will you say those three phrases with me? I belong. I am forgiven. The Spirit is with me. I belong. I'm forgiven. The Spirit is with me. Now, you, I know I've told you this before. All weird things should be told over and over and over again. I am a person who believes so strongly in the promises that God has signed and sealed in baptism that I often will use ordinary water in my life to be reminded of God's promises in, my ba in baptism. So I will stand in the shower and I will gather water in my hands and I will splash myself in the name of the Father and the name of the Son in the name of the Holy Spirit, I belong. I am forgiven. The Spirit is with me. We can be reminded about God's promises in our life over and over and over and over. It can happen in a shower. It can happen while you're washing your hands. You can drive through the car wash if you'd like. You can drink a glass of water. You can brush your teeth. Whatever the ritual would be, that part of it is not what we don't have, but what we do have. And what we have in Christ is a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, being kept in heaven for you who are being protected by God for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. How can I rejoice if I forget? And so every day, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, I belong, I am forgiven, the Spirit is with me, and now when I understand that, I can go and head out into my day and be a person of indescribable and glorious joy because I am being reminded of what I have and who I am in Christ, and the same gift is there for you and for me. Pastor Alistair Begg, preaching his sermon on joy, shared a story of a patient who had been incredibly sick, brain cancer, been in the hospital for weeks on end, and the doctor went in and read through the notes that had been put together over the course of those three weeks. At one point, there was an edit, an addition to the notes from one of the nurses who had served at night. She wrote about this patient. Patient X is inappropriately joyful. When the doctor asked the patient about that, the patient simply said, Doc, 
I sick, I'm sick and I know I'm going to die but it doesn't matter because death doesn't win in my life. Jesus wins. Why could that patient be inappropriately joyful in the face of a disease and sickness and death? Why could we potentially in the world in which we live be inappropriately joyful with an indescribable and glorious joy? It's pretty simple. It's this. Because of what God has done for me in Christ, because of what God has done for you in Christ, you belong to the family of God. You, my friend, are a citizen of heaven because you believe Jesus. Every sin that you have ever committed, even the ones you don't think you should be forgiven of, every sin you're committing right now, every sin you will commit, you've been forgiven if you believe in Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, the spirit of the living God, the spirit that hovered over creation, the spirit that birthed Jesus in the womb of Mary, the spirit that caused Pentecost to happen, the spirit that anointed Peter on that day of Pentecost, that same spirit has been promised to you and to me and to us together. The Spirit is with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we belong. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are forgiven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit is with us. For that reason and that reason alone, we can live with an indescribable and glorious joy, for we are receiving the outcome of our faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Pray with me. Lord, our world needs to see the light of joy. And yet so often your church is not a joy-filled people. We complain a lot, we grumble a lot, we nitpick a lot, but to be joyful. Joyful because of what you've done for us. Lord, today we stand before you and we say we believe. We believe in what Jesus has done, we believe in what Jesus has done for us. And so we pray an overwhelming sense of joy being created in us and joy being shared through us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we respond in joy to God's gift of salvation, we present our tithes and offerings. Deacons.
before we leave one last time, repeat after me. I belong. I, belong. I am forgiven. The Spirit is with me. And so, friends, may that promise of God placed in each of our lives be our source of indescribable and glorious joy. You belong to the family of God. You are forgiven. The Holy Spirit is with you. And as you go live that out, may the love of God the Father, the abundant grace of Jesus Christ, his Son, and the continuous and the constant activity of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.